From the moment that I first played this organ at Knox, I was struck by an immense rapport which is possible between the instrument and the player. The majority of organs sit there and sort of challenge you to come and make music on them if you dare. But at Knox, the instrument seems to open its arms and say to you, come on, let's have fun, let's make music. Now this quality is so rare in instrument building that I think it indicates that the builder has left part of his soul in the instrument. It's as though his love for beautiful sound is expressed here and that it springs from the very roots of music itself. <laughs> I've never heard any organ that has my uh, musical regulation. See, the one at the cathedral and every other organ, they're manufactured in factories, the Beckerath, you know, mm. all that. And when they're scaling the organ, uh, okay, voicer, I want you to, want you to voice that eight foot principle and an eight foot in act before it. You want to make it even in tone and loudness from bass to treble, right through. Same same sound right through. Can you yeah. think of any musical instrument that is the same loudness and tone quality from the bottom note to the top note? No. Violin is rich in harmonics at bottom G. At the top note is lacking in harmonics of its if you turn on the radio and you hear the last note of a piece of music, as you often do, whether it's an orchestra, a clarinet, a flute, a violin or whatever, that top note at the end that you didn't hear anything else of is the same. All the top notes are the same. The character is in the whole company. The clarinet has a shallow register in the left hand, it is the clarinet sound. It's only there for an octave and a bit in the left hand. That's the shallow register of a clarinet. The rest is keen at the bottom and the top note of the clarinet is a flute sound. There's no, no uh, overtones. Mm. Now, have you ever heard uh, um, a recorder quartet. The, the bass recorder is almost inaudible. Mm. It's too long and thin to make enough sound. The top note of the recorder can be excruciatingly loud. Yes. But the, the recorder quartet is another, it's one of the refinements of early music that we hear from the experts. It goes from inaudible in the bass to loud in the treble. Classical music or any music goes from soft in the bass to loud in the treble. Violins, soft at bottom G, can play it loud up in B. E. Mm. The, the character of music is soft to loud as you go up. If you're playing a flute, the higher you play, the harder you have to play to get the top notes to work. They go from soft in the bass to loud in the treble. All organs are exactly either flat or they go from loud in the bass to soft in the treble. Have you ever heard an exciting piece of music that was soft as it went up? Boring. Right. That's what's wrong with all the organs. They're either level or bass in the bass heavy and treble light. So you've always wanted to build organs that have a, a very top heavy and, and soft in the bass to match the those. Instruments. Well, the cathedral. Mm. The cathedral cadactate, the first one I made, was narrow at eight foot, like four foot stopped, was narrow. Whereas anyone else would have made a wide one to get the, the scaling at halving on the 16th pipe. You make it half the diameter 
on the 16th pipe. Now the only difference I've done is turned, made a straight line on which you'd half of the 16th and put the top up so that it had a rising characteristic. That's all I did. It turned an organ into a musical instrument. Right. So do you, I think a lot of organs tend to be bass heavy because they're designed for people to sing with them. Singing hymns in, in a dead church. Well, that's the problem. They're, they're, they're made for Anglican churches which have rough stone walls, um, tongue and groove ceiling and a tongue and groove floor in wood, thin wood, raised up from the concrete floor. The entire place is designed and built to absorb all your all your sound. Naturally, you have to have a heavy pipe in the bass to try and make the basses all transmitted out of the church into the fresh air or under the floor. Right. Look at St Mary's Cathedral. Stone floor. Nothing lost. Look at St Andrew's Cathedral. They put a wooden floor under the seats to keep your feet warm in winter. <laughs> Destroy the acoustics. So, yes, most churches have been doing that recently. Putting in carpet and things. St Andrew's Cathedral. The acoustics are terrible. The organ sounds... I can't bear to listen to the organ. Mm. So do you, how important is acoustic when you think about music for organ? Well, music comes into your brain through your ear, which the drum of which is vibrated by vibrations in the air. Right? Mm. That's how you hear music. You're not listening to the instrument. The instrument is vibrating the air. Yep. Which is then modified to come into your ear. Of course. The acoustics are, are for organ, an essential part of the instrument. That's what they're doing to the opera house now. Destroying, by, you know, I was responsible for that glorious high concert hall. I was responsible. I mm. made that. I heard about that, yeah. I designed the organ. And I put it up the high. They had to make it like that. And when they, when the acoustic consultant was embarrassed and wanted to ruin it and make it lower, I saved it. Now, unfortunately, they're spending 150 million to destroy it. They got a Danish builder who's given 150 million to come in and redesigned the concert hall to fix the bad acoustics. Now, I said to him when, he, when I met him, I said, if someone came to you and said, here's $150 million to fix the bad acoustics, would you say to them, sorry, I can't take it. The acoustics are right as they are. We can't improve them. Don't pay me the $150 million. You think he'd turn down $150 million contract? Of course not. He's destroying my life's work. You now, over the last what, five to ten years, they've had three people. The first one was Malkovich, an actor who put on his show in the concert hall, which was speaking. You can't speak in two, two seconds of uh, reverberation. Right. And he went on television. Terrible acoustics. The opera house has got these horrible, terrible acoustics. Uh -huh. He wanted to put on a, an act show in a musical hall. That was followed by Edo the Ward, Edo the Bart, Edo the Ward got full face on television. <laughs> Ugly as you can imagine. The damn acoustics in the opera, they are terrible. The sound rings around up there. 
And I said, supposed to ring around up there. If it doesn't ring around up there, you've got no no quality, no warmth. Then they the orchestra, Timmy Symphony, got uh, David Robertson as a conductor. And the first time I saw him on television, I saw oh, another narcissist narcissus. You'd see him Yeah. She was the greatest composer there, the greatest conductor there was. He wanted every nuance of his conducting to come through. And it couldn't with two seconds reverberation, the terrible acoustics. Right? And he right. quite entered the orchestra, he got the chief the chief uh, cellist to back him up. She she couldn't play right because she couldn't hear the player on the other side of the orchestra, 40 feet away, because they had no low ceiling to reflect the sound. You were supposed to hear the one on the other side. You're a musician. You play with the conductor. You know the piece anyway. How many conductors have stood up there and said, well, anyway, orchestra, if I weren't here, you'd still play it all right. Anyway. <laughs> You don't have to. And so he got the orchestra on side to say the acoustics were terrible. Now they had these clouds, rings. Yes. Right. Well, when the thing was handed over, it had this beautiful big room that had reverberation. And the acoustic consultant said the orchestra want clouds so that the sound goes up and comes back. Otherwise they feel as if they're playing in the open air. You can't hear you. Right. So they had to have these clouds against the advice of me and Warwick Mahaffey and the acoustic that would ruin our space. So the orchestra could hear the, the reflection. And, uh, and so this all led to the orchestra wanting and the management who wanted to improve the acoustics because someone said so, the general manager, chief executive officer, the lady, didn't know a thing about it. They just brainwashed her. I've got her on television. Yeah. When she comes and tells me, oh yeah, the sound goes away up there and doesn't come back. So we've got to fix these acoustics. Of course the sound goes up there and doesn't come back. It comes back as warmth and musicality and reverberation. But the acoustics are bad in the Opera House concert hall for a reason, and it cannot be fixed, no matter how much you spend. Utsun loved plywood to look at. And Utsun designed the Opera House shelves of concrete mm. and the concert hall of plywood. And the total weight he designed the base foundations to take that. Now, the acoustics are wrong in the Opera House concert hall because it's made of plywood and all the treble is reverberated, but there's no base. There's no warmth, no musicality, no consolidating, no saving of base frequency because it's made of thin wood that transmits the base right. is five inch concrete that maintains it. So no matter what you do, you can't make, when they went to make the proper concert all in five inch concrete, they found that the base foundations were not strong enough and had to be made of plywood. Utsun's stupidity. Utsun was on television one day said, I want the Opera House concert hall to reverberate like a beautiful violin. Does the audience sit inside the violin? <laughs> right. The six of a violin made of very thin wood. Anything to do with retaining low frequency in a, in a hall. Utsun knew nothing whatsoever about acoustics and about what he was doing. We've got all these books on, on the opera house. Now, all these books written by experts, how great Utsun was, 
Harry Seidler wanting to bring Hootson back, not because he had a good concert hall, but because he was another architect. Yep. It was all together now. He's an architect and he's been sacked. We want him back. Does he? And you see how he... So he, he, he didn't understand the acoustic requirements of the concert hall and the materials. Material. He didn't understand the, the correct materials that would have made it reverberate. No. Mm. The concert should have been five-inch concrete, concert hall, in the shape that I made it. You had to have a certain volume of air for every, for every seat. If you're an acoustic consultant and you're going to make a concert hall, you say, how many people in it? 2,700. That's, that's, we need so many cubic feet of air in the hall. That means it's got to be that high, that wide and that long to get that many cubic feet. We had it. We had the parallel, nearly parallel walls and a crown that reverberated the sound. One thing Peter Hall had to have was sight lines. Every seat had to see the centre of the stage to see what was happening. But sight lines, unobstructed. Yep. Well, if you've got a sight line that's unobstructed, you've also got an unobstructed path for the sound. If the sound right. will reflect off something and distort it, you've got a clear sound. And what we had was a clear path to nearly every seat with a direct sound, undistorted, plus from high above, a distant reverberation and warmth coming down to solidify the, the sound and give it musicality. We had all that at all. But you get conductors out, like David Robertson, who had to have every movement of his genius seen and heard, you know. Mm. Couldn't have a vibration. You know, did you hear that the chief, the orchestra leader, first violin, uh, left, and the first clarinet resigned. Soon after Robertson took over, the two most important people in the orchestra were out. Wow. They couldn't stand him. Is he a highly rated classical lover or is he an American from California? That's a tragedy that they got him. Did, did the, what was that conductor that died? We've had a number of conductors. Did any of them complain? Right. No, only, the only complaints came from that actor, Melkovich. Mel, uh, Mel is bad, isn't it? Melkovich. And Edo the Wart. And David Robinson. They were the only complainants. They were the other com conductors from Bernard Hines right through uh, complained. that the concert hall is there to play the music for the playing audience. But because we're in Sydney, Australia, the orchestra was unionised and the orchestra, if you played in, in an orchestra every day, the same old thing, the same place, you'd get bored. You'd want good working conditions. You would have a leader like Donald Hazelwood who was a union organiser, plug for good conditions for the orchestra, not good conditions for the audience. And the orchestra had to work a bit harder to play it, play for them. They had to have good conditions for their play. It's Australia. Uh, Terrible. Oh, wow, that was... <laughs> so that's that. Yeah. It's always my aim to produce a superb musical instrument. An instrument in which all pipes harmonised no matter what combinations they were used in. To achieve this, each and every pipe had to be meticulously voiced to, to match harmonically all the others. 
and there are 10,000 pipes or more in this organ, which makes it the largest mechanical organ in the world. Not that size is important in its own way, it's just that I needed so many pipes to achieve the tonal effect, that is, many pipes singing instead of a few pipes screaming. Did you have to, when you were designing the Opera House organ, did you have to make those acoustic decisions based on what those what was essentially not ideal? I had to make an organ for the Opera House. One, what does it have to do? I'm not making my organ. What does it have to do? Well, it has to make the entire gamut of organ music, if possible. To do that, it has to have a specification of pipes that will allow it to do that. Once you've got that, what does it have to do? It has to be adequately loud, have a beautiful tone of the pipes, and uh, it has to have acoustics. Mm -hmm. And uh, would the acoustics be good enough in a hall of nearly 3,000 people with a low ceiling? That would be dead. What do you have to do? Warwick Mahaffey was the ABC acoustic consultant. He, he worked the machinery behind the scenes for years that got me the job as the organ builder, that got the opera house made, that got the concert hall single use for the orchestra, not dual purpose for an opera and a mm. concert at the same time. That was very important. <laughs> we did it, all that. No one knows that Warwick Mahaffey is the guiding hand behind it all. And he got me the job, not because he liked me, because he saw from the very start I had a spark that would make the right organ. And he, he organised he organised Peter Herford to come become consultant. He organised the uh, leaders of the Organ Institute and Organ Society to be a committee. He got them all to vote me in, which wasn't corruption. It was getting the right. Anyone but me couldn't have done it. Sure. Not only would have they made a noisy machine, which all the pipes were raw and unvoiced. Most organs aren't voiced properly. Mm. And they'd have made this terrible organ and could they have taken over from me and made my specification of 200 ranks, 120 stops, uh, the biggest organ with tracker organ, tracker action ever made. Could they have made it? No, one, one organ builder wrote to the Herald and said, this organ's going to have it, a key touch of 24 pounds. 11 kilogram touch on the keys. Why? Because they all said, if you make an organ of that specification, organs are made like they've always been made, with big, thick wooden sliders and great big pneumatic or electric motors to move the sliders, you know, that they couldn't make it. Mm. I made it because I said, what does it have to do? You know, step by step to make it do what it had to do. I'd already made the wind chest with the same sliders that Knox. Right. You could pull a slider with your little finger. And Mark Fisher took people up to show them the opera house organ. As you walked up the stairs, there, were the, there was the end of the great wind chests right there. And you go, see, I'm moving the slider. And the greatest organ builders in the world would go, <laughs> huh? wow. How do you do that? You don't make it like they always made it. You say, what does it have to do? And, and with two millimetre gap, you didn't have to have more than a quarter or three eighths of an inch to stop the wind wasting through the little gap. Right. They all had to have a, a big thick slider in wood and a sprung seal for every note, 61 springs holding the slider down so it wouldn't move. Right, <coughs> yeah. So the, 
the opera house organ has a chest which has sliders that can be pulled by an ordinary note magnet and pallets that don't allow the pipes to rob when you add more pipes. So neither of those could have been done by any other commercial organ builder. Right. Well. And it was all done by an amateur. Yep. Who wasn't an organ builder, but was a free thinker who thought from an intelligent observation through simple logic and step by step cause and effect to make an improved result. Like all the other things I've done, I've improved it to as good as it could go. Mm -hmm. And I did that with all the college. Excellent. Can I ask you? Can I ask you a few questions? Um, as we, just to, because I've got a few questions I want to ask before we finish. Yeah. Um, I was gonna. I I noticed that all your organs um, seem to be most inspired by the German Baroque instruments. Would you say that's true? Well, if you went from a life in Sydney, hearing Anglican church organs in den sandstone buildings, right? Mm. And then you went to Weingarten or such a Kobe Lubeck, how could you not be totally impressed? It's the acoustics, but it's the organ in those acoustics. Mm. It is so good. Yeah. Um, I was going to ask, I sometimes wondered, um, as, a, as an Australian, why you didn't choose to use Australian stop names, but always used German stop names. They were the only ones that named every stop. The way I wanted. Right. Well, so it was a descriptive. Australian ones that I hated. Um, some of the names they put on them, I couldn't stand the, the noise, the sound of the names. Diapace, Nate, uh, some of the others. Mason, Flute, uh, things like, like that. In German, they were. They could all be there in German and describe what was there. Okay, so you use that as your, as your model for well, why you... Well, artistic. Mm. Uh, some of the Australians were not intelligent and artistic. Mm. They were put there by Australian organ builders for Australian organists who all only wanted to play a noise for hymns in a dead church. Sure. So did did um did your Australian identity have any impact on your instruments? Well, Australia was a country of people like me who were free thinking and wanted to do things without having to ask, and, uh, who had useful energy to do things. Um, I. So I wanted to bring to Australia the European organ that was correct. Yep. That sort of music. And anyway, a good, a good classical organ like the European ones in a good room could play any music, any romantic or classical music, because it was musical. If you had an organ that was musical, it could play anything. Yep. And that's what happens when an organist becomes organist in a church. <clears throat> the first thing they do is want to change the organ. They want to, oh, that needs a mixture. That needs a 16 foot. That needs a two and two thirds. It needs three more stops on the positive. Mm. Of course, they're not musical. If they made a musical sound, they wouldn't be so insistent on replacing them. Mm. The reason they wanted to enlarge the organs they were appointed to because they made horrible noise and weren't musical. Mm. Yep. <coughs> uh, a question now, not so much about the music, but about the aesthetic, the visual aspect of your organs. Um, I, I know that a lot of your organs have a, quite a minimal organ case 
although St. John's Reed um, has a beautiful Baroque organ case. Yeah. So I wondered if you had, you had a choice or could, had any control over what the organ case would look like. That was a genius of Ormond College. It was in a small dead chapel. And you looked up to see it. You wanted to see the usual organ case with the front pipes in it. But the Ormond College organ didn't have a case. It had slats angled to such a to such a an angle that when you looked at the organ, it was a solid case. Right. To the sound of the pipes it was completely out in the open. It had to be in the open because in a small dead chapel, the sound had to come from all, all around. If you channeled the sound straight down to the audience from a solid case in a small chapel, it wouldn't be right. I see, yep. And did you have- well, The best organ doesn't have a case to sound, but often you want a case to keep the dust off, stop people stealing the pipes. Right. I think I think I, I think I asked because those European organs have such a visual appeal, which I feel complements the music. Have you felt that? Of course it does. Yeah, the, be the beauty of seeing the instrument, I think. Yeah. Mm. That's what's going to be wrong in the opera house. If they lower the ceiling with a whole layer of ugly plastic plywood, uh, ugly plywood. It's ugly and you can't enjoy the music if you feel oppressed by a layer of ugly plywood over your head. Right. Oh, well. Okay, um, I have another question. I wanted to ask you about Peter Herford. What sort of question about Peter Herford? I, well, more particularly, um, he's made recordings at the Opera House and at Knox Grammar, I think. Yeah. And I, I just wondered whether um, his philosophy of organ, organ building was similar, was the same as yours? Or well, did you have a difference? Well, he gave a recital at the Opera House in which he played some a trio sonatas. And, um, Barry Benson, as he, who got him to play there, forced him to give a talk about the music before he played. Well, the greatest musicians who came out never stood there and gave a talk. They came out and played. So that, that put him down a, a peg or two in the eyes of those who just wanted him to play. Anyway, the registration, there he had a, the biggest tracker organ in the world with 120 stops, and he registered the trio sonatas as if it was in one of these small German organs. One, one rank for this, one rank for that, and one rank for that. And I sat there listening, thinking I wanted to shout out, put some stops on, let's hear it. You see? See, the organ is a polyphonic instrument and its tone is a combination of pipes. Mm. Now, I put enough ranks of pipes into the opera house organ that you could make up what you wanted. Right? Now, I could have had, instead of being a 120 stop organ, it could have been a 50 stop organ. But 50 stops with combinations of pipes permanently coupled together. Right? right. But because the pipes were already there and the chest had to be made the way I made it, it was just as easy to have them all separate as to have groups of pipes. The problem with that is having them all separate, they'd be abused. Whereas if I'd joined them all together in proper groups, as other people would like to hear, uh, they wouldn't have known the difference and played them like that. When I was asked to demonstrate the organ to the 
organist from Brisbane Concert Hall, he said, play me the eight foot principal. Well, I played him two or three pipes together. He said, no, I want to hear the eight foot principal. I don't want to hear the combination. Well, the combination on that organ was the eight foot principal. I see. He didn't even know that. Right. I made an organ with a lot of stops that could be combined to make what you wanted, but you could also play them singly if you only wanted them singly. Right. An organ for everyone, but of course not everyone played it. Only brainwashed organists played it, and they had to pull all the stops they, they were taught to, to pull. And to make it louder, they had to pull all the mixtures and upper work to make it loud. You don't, you, yep. don't, you don't do that. If you read the Fletcher and Munson curves, you pull all the middle sounding stops to make it loud. And when you play, play them softly, you add some little things to that as appropriate. You can do anything you wanted. And that's the problem. As soon as you give someone unfettered access to everything, they ruin it. That's why the organ and legal went so wrong. Right. Because they all went too far the other way. Well, I think a lot of them didn't know how to how to tone how to do the get the right tone for the upper work, which is something you really got right. Well, I didn't really. I wish I could have softened a lot of the upper work now because when they pull it out, it's just another shrieking organ. Hideous. Well, I didn't. See, the upper work isn't all meant to be played with chords to make the organ loud. So what's your design? How do you see them being used in repertoire? Well, the organs are polyphonic instrument. You're playing one finger on one end, one finger on the other, and one foot on the pedals. Now if you play an organ with level work like that, properly, polyphonically, it doesn't shrink. But if you pull all those stops and play full third chords, third, fifth, sixth chords mm. on two hands, it's just a cacophonic noise. Yes. You don't play, play it loud like that. So you you've always... By pulling all the eight foot and four foot stops, and adding reeds, and that's loud. It doesn't have to shriek and, and uh, break the windows of the concert hall to be loud. Loud music is loud relative to soft music. Yep. Yep. I understand that entirely. That's the trouble with the violin and piano. If you try and play loud by scraping the bow on the strings or banging the notes on a piano, you destroy the sound. Mm. You don't play loud like that. Mm. You play on the piano, you play harmonic chords that add together to make it sound loud and after you've played softly. So I think a lot of organists misunderstood your instrument because they're so <laughs> used to having one mixture and they would use that mixture in the chorus whenever they want to be loud. Well, there's three or four mix to add together. Mm. But fact, you, you give them more choice. I did. But uh, I didn't educate the organists how to play it because they were professional organists. They should already know how to play it. Harry Benson wanted me to write a book on how to play it. It could be handed to organists. I'd already killed myself to exhaustion laying the damn organ. Right. The last thing I could do was write instructions for organists how to play. I didn't have the energy. Um. Also on your organs, you you love to use uh, you love to have a lot of Nazard's tierces or a sesquialtera on every manual, and 
I was going to ask, because they're always some of the, the nice, really nice stops on your organs. And I wondered how you see them being used. Well, you can either have five stops to make a cornet, or you can have three stops to make a Seth Scrowderer, or a Tertia, and you can have what you want. Hmm. You can have just pull out on the on the on the rook positive. You can pull out an eight foot connect and a sesquialtera, or you can also add the components of the sesquialtera, two and two thirds and one and three fifths, out of the separate two and two thirds and one one and three fifths. You can make a louder sesquialtera. Yeah, two or three levels of sesquialtera loudness as you could with other combinations of stops. Right. Yeah, for a real musician who knows what an organ is and how to play it to use. But we never found one. It's, it's interesting when you, when you talk about, especially when you talk about how instruments change in their timbre as they go up in range and then what you tried to do with your organs. Because yes. it, it makes it sound as though your your idea of the uh, organ reform movement was to make organs sound like an orchestra. Or, or any musical instrument that had to sound musical. Hmm. Was, I wasn't an organ builder making an organ for organ builders. I was a musical instrument maker making a musical instrument for musicians who played the organ. Yes. And that's, that's the difference, I think. Well, any musical instrument you try to listen to will rise in volume as you rise in pitch. Mm. Everyone, as I say, to get a flute or a clarinet to play loud, you have to blow it hard and it rises in pitch. Yep. It doesn't fall in pitch. Exactly. Um, something else I wanted to ask about because I, I spent a lot of time at Wollongong Town Hall and I was going to ask, you put two tremulants on that organ yeah. and I wondered um, if you had a particular idea of, you have a slow tremulant and a, and a faster tremulant. Well, the slow one was for the classical purists and the fast one was for theatre style music, for playing music that you can jump and, and uh, dance to. Oh, right. <laughs> there you go. And you could put the two together, I remember. You could put the two together. I suppose you could. They were electric. Yeah. It was very interesting because I, I, I enjoyed playing around with those a lot because you could... Hearing Bach played from one to the other and... What I've always liked about your instruments is, especially for a Bach chorale prelude, you could change the solo instrument to so many different options because you had reeds and sesquialteras on both manuals and you had reeds on the pedals. So there's so much option there and the tremulance. That's the idea. Peter Herford recorded um, a trio sonata, I think it was, with the tremulant and he turned the tremulant off before he stopped playing and as he wound down the playing the tremulant slowed down and disappeared perfect you couldn't do that with an ordinary one but because yep. it was an electric electric motor it slowed down before it stopped right beautiful that's exactly what you wanted. You replicate a musical instrument that way. Well, that was a musical use of the tremulant. Mm. Just mm. didn't switch it off thing like that. Wow. <laughs> now, I, I, I do also want to talk to you about your, the Perth Concert Hall organ. Yeah. And because um, I think it's, I don't know much about it myself, but I, it's your second largest organ. Yeah. And is, is that one more appropriate? Is the acoustic better in that one? The acoustics, see Warwick Mahaffey, all the organs I made to start with were made because Warwick Mahaffey 
wanted me to make them. Mm. After a while, other people wanted me to make them and Warwick got very annoyed because he wasn't the one telling me what to make. <laughs> but Warwick would make, get me to make one organ and then he'd say, well, why do, now do you want Perf? He had yep. Perf all lined up. All I had to say was, yes, and I could make the Perf organ because he'd already lined it up and organised it. He he didn't want other people to make organs for me because they wouldn't make them as nice, which made me, gave me organs to make without trying too hard. Yeah. He said, all right, do you want Perth or don't you? I said, but I'm making the opera house. I'm, just, I'm so busy. Well, do you want Perth or don't you? All right, I'll make Perth. <laughs> Perth was made more as anyone else might make it by not doing it all myself, you know, right. getting others to do some of it. But I still did it to be as well as well made as it could be. Is it is it one that hasn't been compromised? Well, that's the trouble. People come in and want to improve my organs because they want work to do. There's one fellow who wants work to do, to keep him employed, and he wants to upgrade Murph. Perth. Right. Well, that's not right. No. That's my organ, that's my intellectual yeah. property. Yeah. Have anyone but me fiddle with it as to spoil it. Yeah. It's, you know, the idea was that it's high time we have the opening recital and we want it played no matter what. Mm. It doesn't matter if you're not ready. Did you want to have more control over how your instrument was played? Well, I should have had all the all. Everything should have been the way I wanted it. Mm. I was asked to make it. It should have been my instrument. Yeah. Anyway. I had it made before it was ready, and it was a fiasco. Ah. It's a shame, isn't it? Once people decide that they want to be in charge, I've done for. Mm. Mm. Yeah, I think there's a, there's a lack of respect there, isn't there? It's... Uh, Narcissus. Yeah. That's Narcissus. Narcissus means that I'm the greatest, I'm going to have it my way, and anyone who doesn't want it my way will be gotten rid of. Yeah. Narcissus. And yeah. that's what happens. They just, tell, they just play no matter what. Yeah. Yeah. Look, uh, thank you so much for, for having this interview with me. I just got too tired, I'm afraid. No, that's all right. Yeah, thanks so much. I really appreciate it. Perhaps I'll contact you in the future and we can talk again. Well, I'm glad you've made it this far and thank you very much for watching the interview. I hope you've enjoyed it. And please remember, if you enjoy this kind of content, please subscribe to Pep Organ and leave a like below. They really help. Thank you.